Welcome to the Leading Through Culture uh, fireside chat discussion we're about to have with the president of the University of California system, Michael Drake. My name is Samir Srivastava, and I'm a professor at the Haas School of Business at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, Jenny, do you want to introduce yourself too? Hi there. I'm Professor Jenny Chapman, also of the Haas School of Business. In a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Jenny to introduce President Drake and to kick off our fireside chat. Uh, but before we do so, I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank uh, President Drake for taking the time to be with us uh, today. I'd also like to thank uh, Anne Harrison, uh, the Dean of the Haas School of Business, uh, who is co-sponsoring uh, this event uh, with us. And um, this event fits within the Berkeley Culture Initiative, which Jenny and I have been co-directing the last uh, four years. And uh, there are two broad objectives to the Berkeley Culture Initiative. Um, and at the end of the session, Jenny will tell you a little bit more about different ways in which you could get involved in our efforts if you are so interested. Um, the first real objective is about uh, the academic mission of what we're trying to do, which is to bring in the next generation of culture research by doing a couple of different things. One is trying to connect researchers across a wide range of academic disciplines that study culture in slightly different ways uh, and to bring these researchers in dialogue with one another. We've now assembled a community of a few hundred scholars from all of the disciplines represented on the slide and around the world that are starting to have a more cohesive, integrated discussion about culture and the future of this research, particularly in light of new data sources and computational tools that are becoming available for the study of culture. The second part of the mission though, is to connect the world of academic research to the world of uh, leadership and practice. And so our annual conference, which you'll hear more about from Jenny at the end, uh, really tries to bring these two communities together uh, to think about ways that we can work on joint uh, problems and research um, in a more collaborative way. This Fireside Chats speaker series uh, is part of our Leading Through Culture initiative. This is the third um, such session. The very first one we did was with uh, Steve Kerr, whose image you see on the right-hand side, uh, the head coach of the Golden State Warriors. And earlier this uh, year, we had another fireside chat series at the Berkeley Culture Conference with David Thomas, the president of Morehouse College. One of the themes this year that we're really focusing on in the Berkeley Culture Initiative is designing co organizational cultures that can help address issues of systemic racism. And that conversation was really important uh, in that regard. We're also thinking about building organizational culture for the future of work in a post-pandemic environment. Uh, and that too uh, will be coming up uh, shortly. So if we can go to the next uh, slide. Uh, so what we wanna do is, uh, especially given our delayed start, dive very quickly into the discussion with President Drake. We would like to still reserve a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. And so if you have questions as we are going, please enter them into the Q&A um, tab that you see at the bottom of your screen. And as you look through that tab, if there are questions others have posed that you were especially interested to hear uh, President Drake address, please upvote to them by clicking on thumbs up. And we'll use that as a guide to selecting questions at the end. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jenny. Thanks, Samir. Um, welcome, President Drake. We, we understand you were caught in the vortex there. <laughs> yeah, there we are. Yes, uh, good to be here, good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we know your schedule is just incredibly busy and we're so grateful to have a little bit of your time um, to spend together. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and jump into uh, a quick introduction and then we'll, we'll ask some questions. Great. Um, it's very difficult to summarize your background quickly because it is uh, accomplished and illustrious, uh, but let me give it a try. Um, so first, we forgive you for your BA from Stanford. Um, <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> um, and um, a big part of your background is in the UC system. So um, President Drake did his residency, his MD, and his fellowship in ophthalmology at UCSF. Um, for 20 years, he was on the faculty there where uh, he published numerous articles, co-authored books, um, was the editor of multiple journals, won research awards, won teaching awards, won medals for university and public service. 
Um, so really an illustrious career just as a faculty member. Um, and then as a leader, uh, he took on the role of system-wide vice president for health affairs. Um, and I understand you're back in the same building that you were um, early in the, the early 2000s. Um, in 2005, President Drake was selected to become chancellor at UC Irvine. Um, and during his time as chancellor, UC Irvine rose to the, the top 10 public universities list. It became the number one university under 50 years old um, and among a, a wide range of incredible accomplishments um, under uh, President Drake's uh, efforts, he increased the, the four-year graduation rate by 18%. In 2014, the Ohio State University um, brought President Drake in as the president of that university. And here again, a, a monstrous list of incredible accomplishments, increasing diversity dramatically, both among students and staff, um, paving the way for student access, um, record high applications and graduation rates, um, really an incredible uh, story there as well. Uh, President Drake now serves on various boards, um, including perhaps most notably the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, I understand that you play some guitar. Uh, if you know anything about the history of the Haas School, our prior Dean Rich Lyons was somewhat of a guitar player and we were uh, known to hear him now and then. So I do hear, hope we get to hear from you um, in that regard at some point. But thank you again so much for joining us. Well, very good uh, to have this time to spend with you and I, uh... I know we were, it took a while to, in cyberspace to get here, so I look forward to being able to meet in person. This is like the equivalent of uh, nobody in the parking place or the, the, the great pink down of the garage, just couldn't get in. But um, uh, I'd love to get to uh, your uh, questions. Let me, if I can speak a little bit at the beginning, but I'd love to just hear your questions and we can just dive, dive right in and thank you for hosting this. Thanks. Well, we do have some questions. Um, uh, before you joined, Samir uh, mentioned to uh, our audience that the Berkeley Culture Initiative is focusing this year in particular on systemic racism um, as one of our core topics. And so we thought it would be useful given um, your focus and the accomplishments that you've mounted to start with the question, you know, what are your aspirations at the University of California with respect to issues of diversity, equity, um, and inclusion, and how does our public mission influence those aspirations? Well, thank you. Straight, I mean, those are uh, critically important questions. You know, diversity, equity, and inclusion are really a top priority for me for my whole career. You mentioned I went to a different um, uh, college for my undergraduate degree, but came to the University of California just after that. And actually, my wife, I you know, hope this, this counts for something, my wife was raised in Berkeley from the time she was a year old, and and then uh, has her, her law degree from Berkeley Law. And so we feel connected uh, in, in those ways. And I hope that gives me a little bit of forgiveness. But I'll say from those days in my uh, training, mainly then in San Francisco and then with the university, we've been focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion from the, the very beginning. And as I kind of moved, you mentioned my career moved from the health sciences specifically then to a little broader uh, area of focus in higher education we've really focused on access, affordability, and excellence. And by access, we mean access to people from all zip codes, from all uh, walks of life to be able to come to our universities. And so that's a, a, a central part of our, of our mission. You know, and Berkeley has a, a real role as a, a real platform for, for ideas, a place where ideas are exchanged and where, where people come together. The Clark Kerr line that we, you know, we're not here to make speech safe for students, we're here to make students safe for speech, was referred to the, 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 the history of the, the culture of Berkeley and bringing people together to exchange ideas, not necessarily or always ideas that one agrees with, but the ideas that come from broadly throughout our society. So I think that's a really important part of what we do as, as universities. 
as a society from the very beginning as a, as a, a country from, from, um, from 1619 uh, forward, uh, really we have been a, a country where equity was not a, a part of our foundational uh, 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 makeup. We started uh, in an unequal way. And we have institutions that were built uh, from uh, from bigotry, from racism, from institutional uh, racism. So that the the country, in growing out of that multiple century legacy, has an incredible amount of work to do. We then try to do that work every day, and uh, part of that's by engaging consciousness and talking. But part of that is trying to look at our policies and procedures and. And, and move things forward with what we actually do, what we think, what we do, the outcomes of those are all critical to making us the place that we want to be in the future. Terrific, thank you. Um, I wanted to pick up, uh, President Drake, on your quotation from Clark Kerr. And um, it sort of relates to the question that I wanted to ask, which is that we're obviously living right now through a period of intense political polarization in the US. And uh, universities are right at the heart of some of the most uh, impassioned debates that are taking place. Yes. Um, and so given the focus on inclusion, um, I'd like to hear your perspective on how university leaders can create a, a culture in which people not only tolerate, but actually seek to understand and engage with opposing viewpoints. And particularly, how do we do so when the opposing parties often don't even agree on the basic facts? Yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's this has been, a uh, question for us always, how do we do this? You know, the, so, so if we think about our neighborhoods, our communities, our, our, our villages, our countries, our tribes over the years, we tended to associate with people who are like us. That's kind of where we, as human beings came from. We like, you know, our families, our, our communities, our uh, neighborhoods, et cetera. There were overlays that made it difficult for us to, to, to mix, but, but Never, whatever the circumstances, those are the places that we tended to come from. And then we might mix together in a variety of things, walking down the sidewalk downtown or going to a ball game or something else, but we go home or going to work even, but we go home at night to our uh, pretty homogeneous neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And one of the differences at universities, particularly residential universities and particularly residential universities in this last half century is that we have seen increasing diversity. We've welcomed, we've celebrated, we've worked to build increasing diversity. But now we have people who really never grew up with whoever the other was, mm -hmm. going to school together, working together, and for those who are residential, living together um, over, overnight. And, uh, and, and so there, there's a lot of opportunity for the coming together of people with different traditions, different ideas. And, and different points of view. And what we work to do is to make it that when that coming together happens, it's an opportunity to share and to grow and to learn. And, and rather, rather than uh, an opportunity for conflict and confrontation. So we work on that, we try to model it, we celebrate it uh, on, a, on a, a daily basis, but it takes real work because we, you know, this, if you um, go back 50 years and then from the time, from all the way back in history before that, there weren't communities as diverse uh, as our as our universities that that had to work these things out. You worked it out by having a different name, living in a different place, having a different language, and only coming together with with conflict. and uh, And we're trying to model a different way of us of moving forward. And it's so it's it's a, an ongoing experiment in creating the the future. Yeah, you're. Uh, I'm a I'm a social psychologist by training, and you're reminding me of the similarity attraction bias that we have that is yes. so, so potent um, and you know, difficult to, to reckon with. Um, so I have a question that those of us who study culture have been getting all year, and I, I'm really interested in your take on this. Um, during your first year as, as president of the, of the UC system, it hasn't even been a year, it's just been since August. I bet it feels longer than a year. <laughs> um, you know, the university has faced unprecedented challenges as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and social unrest. And so I'm wondering what leadership strategies you have found effective in guiding the UC system through this time, or what advice do you have for other leaders who are trying to 
um, foster, cultivate culture strength during this time of massive change and uncertainty? You know, I'd like to say something clever, <laughs> you know, and prescient and, and as well, but it's, I would say this has been extraordinarily difficult. Um, the things that we have usually used you know, in that um, uh, the, the, the similarity attraction bias concept of building a community where you feel comfortable and using that for strength and, and, and to nurture oneself, that's, that's been taken away from us in ways that we've never imagined before. We're separated from our families, you know, from our friends and the people who we enjoy being with most. And so the, the real uh, support that we get by convening and coming together which has been, in my experience, the most important part of getting through other things like the Great Recession or whatever else, that's just what's been taken away from us. We have, uh, nice to meet you in two dimensions, you know, and, and high def, but it's just not the same as being, uh, as, as being together. So this has been, I, I think, an extraordinarily challenging time for everyone. And the fact that it's, it's everyone and it's all around the world has made it um, surreal in ways that we, uh, that, again, we've all experienced. And, and let me say, whenever I say that, I want to make sure that we focus on people who um, lost loved ones, uh, uh, family members, uh, lost businesses, um, uh, lost their homes, all the terrible things that really will change the lives, have ended lives and will change other lives by the millions um, as we move forward. So it's been um, an incredible uh, disruption of our normal lives. What I tried to do in 2008, 9, 10, through that time, mm -hmm. um, and what we tried to do in dealing with friction on campus when we had people with strongly held views that were incompatible, is to try to uh, remember our values and to think about what those things that were important to us as people and to try always to use values-based decision making. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll tell you the seven values that I that I wrote that we began when I was at um, UC Irvine. I was being interviewed once, and I had to have some. I don't want to say I had to have some values, but I was going to be talking about values. And I wrote them. I was in a hotel room, and I had that little pencil and little pad by the phone, and I wrote wrote down. I thought, well, seven's a good number, and and that actually worked out nicely. It was it was a moment of uh, clarity a few years ago. But the seven values that I used were uh, respect, and that's respect for oneself and for, uh, for others. Uh, we're uh, a university, uh, intellectual curiosity, wanting to learn, wanting to discover, wanting to teach was important. I believe that's very important, uh, that integrity is a very important value, uh, telling the truth, being able to be trusted. I think that for an institution of excellence like ours, and it, that commitment is a very important value passion, uh, really caring about what you're doing and putting your all into it. I found that it's very important to be, uh, to have empathy for others, to uh, do what you can to understand the other person's point of view. So empathy is an important value. And then one that I refer to as appreciation. I mean, it, it is more easily explained as like tolerance for people who have a different view, but tolerance kind of means you, you're right and you're, you're tolerating them. I, I want us to appreciate the fact that other people come from different traditions, have had different life experiences and, and might believe something that, that, that we don't believe. And then finally, fun. I, 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 this is our only life. And you know you can do all those other things and, and not be happy. We should be doing things that, that are fun. And the idea is that you do all of them all the time, uh, uh, not one or two or three. And, uh, and so I've been thinking about that a lot during this time. and. Uh, uh, trying to be empathetic, trying to be supportive, trying to continue to be intellectually curious and um, looking for, I'm a, 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 uh, I'm really devoted to seeing good news and little snippets of good news as they come forward to say, gosh, we're, we're able to get to a little more normalcy as these uh, days and weeks roll forward. And, um, and you know, trying to keep calm and carry on. So that's been the, the thrust. Terrific, thank you. So let me um, ask a question that also connects a little bit with some of the questions that have been coming up uh, in the Q&A um, box. And that really has to do with, uh, again, your track record of uh, success at Ohio State and UC Irvine in really um, changing the mix of students that were admitted and enrolled, diversifying that mix, but also creating um, a, a greater sense of belonging and inclusion. 
And you mentioned the, the values that you emphasized, but if you could maybe dive in a little bit more into specific practices that you thought were most effective, uh, that would be helpful. And in the Q&A, people have asked, for example, about uh, insofar as you could characterize an academic culture as being a so-called white culture, uh, what are some ways to make uh, UC uh, more anti-racist? Uh, and, and the more specific you could be, that would be, be really helpful. Yeah, so, so it's a difficult, uh, again, being not being racist is one thing, and that's, that's a great start. Being anti-racist is much more difficult. That's the landscape uh, that uh, we've all grown in and how to work against that when oftentimes we, you know, David Williams, the great social uh, scientist, uh, uh, has a whole series of studies and things and great description of the fact that it's uh, unconscious, that you, you don't have to do it or think it or whatever. It's just the way things have been and what you've learned and the way things are and understanding your unconscious biases and being able to both um, understand them and then confront them and then change the way that they would lead you to behave, that's an, that's an ongoing daily effort. So that's, I think, realizing it and working to uh, move against it's one thing. For me, I'll, I'll say, uh, as we tried, have we tried to diversify and be inclusive on my campuses and the past and programs I've worked with, the first thing is to be authentic and to really, I, I think that's critical. You, 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 you have to really want to have people there and work with people broadly and, and I, I think you can't, you can't fake it. You can't just say it. I think it has to really be something that, that the leadership uh, and broadly the community feels. So we've worked hard to model that behavior and to celebrate that behavior and to try to make sure we were being uh, authentic. And then with our uh, students and our faculty and our staff tried to do what we could to be supportive of people who are coming from uh, what we will describe as diverse backgrounds. Uh, uh, but that's it's a it's an active effort that we all have to uh, be engaged in, and and then I um, I can I can say this in rooms with small numbers of people, you know, and I can I can try here, but I want those people who join us to understand that they were um, asked or recruited to come and join us because they are critical to our quality and who we are in the future, and so they're who we are. It's not. It's it's their university. It's it's not it's not someone else's university. It's yours. Uh, this is your home, uh, whoever you are, for all of our students. And I've felt that way and had this conversation with individual students or with groups of students. But I want each person to feel when they're on campus that they're at home, and we want to do what we can to make it that that's that that's true. And it's an ongoing effort in innumerable ways, but. We bring people in, we need them to be who we need to be. And it, it is all, this university belongs to all of us. Um, I once, my father actually was a professor at UC Berkeley before me. Great, for, great. For 30 years. And I once counted up the number of years that my family has spent um, in the UC system. And it's at this point, well over a hundred years. So <laughs> we do- feel like that for me too, but I won't say you. <laughs> <laughs> we do feel like it's home, um, literally, so. So you grew up, you grew up then in Berkeley. I did. Yes, yeah. yeah. So my, my, again, my wife grew up in Berkeley. Her, her parents worked in the region, but not at the campus, but she moved um, uh, uh, to Berkeley when she was um, a year old. And so went to grade school and high school high school in Oakland. Um, her mother lives in Oakland today. So oh. it really is, um, so I'm sure you all were in the same, um, you know, same hood. Well, <laughs> I actually married my, um, my high school sweetheart from Berkeley High. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> a, long, a long Berkeley story. Um, now, can I, Jenny, maybe say, I'm a, 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 tell a Berkeley story if I may, a Clark Kerr Berkeley story if I may, just real briefly when I arrived at Irvine, uh, a wonderful uh, uh, senior faculty member at the time, um, I'll just use his first name of John, um, I came by and he, and he gave me a gift. And the gift was a Fortune magazine and it was from September 1965. And this was September of 2005, so it was 40 years old. So it was, you know, becoming dust, but it was still there. And it had a picture of Sailor Gate at noon uh, filled with students. And he said, oh, I thought you would like this 
he just had kept it all those years and it was a very nice uh, gift, a, a lovely uh, uh, person. Uh, I came to love and admire, but I, it was just me. He just brought us a nice gift that he'd had and said, here, have this. And I mentioned because the, the cover story was about Berkeley and about Clark Kerr. And so that, that was a Clark Kerr edition. So I still have the, 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 the magazine. But I was talking to someone about diversity at Berkeley, and this was someone who had been a faculty member at Berkeley in 1965, and was now at UC Irvine and was kind of a senior person, but saying, well, we had you know, quite a bit of diversity back then. And I'll say, gosh, I just don't remember it. you know. And, and so we had a little bit of an, anyone to disagree, but I went and looked at my magazine cover and there were maybe a hundred and some odd students identifiable by face in this group picture. And I believe there was one Asian, one woman who appears to be Asian, but that's it. Um, and so the diversity then was nil, N nil, nil on nil. I mean, it was really just nil. The change to today's, to, to 2005 or today's photograph at noon at Sailor Gate is dramatically different, an entirely different picture. So there's more to do. We have, uh, I, I mentioned structural and institutional racism and biases and things that have meant that we have over all kinds of ways that we're not anywhere near where we need to be in faculty and leadership and so many, so many ways, numbers of African-American students and, uh, and, and numbers of Latino students in, in particular, numbers of Native American students. Um, but the diversity on the campus is different now than it was a decade or decades ago. So I think there is movement going forward and we just have to make sure to work with that, to celebrate that, to embrace that and to keep that activity going forward. And uh, that's just, that's a story from back in the day. I mean, just sort of back to the, the, I mean, this is an incredibly complex organization. What we have, um, is it 20 campuses and five medical centers and- um, It's 10, but you know, they're big campuses, and, uh, yeah, yeah, but that's okay. Uh, okay. my mind. Ten, yeah. um, the medical centers, we have the, the labs. Um, it's a very, very complex organization with very different uh, constituent interests. Um, uh, lots of different things that people want from the institution. Um, and so how do you see um, at, it, as, the, as the president, what, what do you see as the levers that you have available to you for um, enacting some of these visionary um, objectives that, that you have uh, in, in mind? You know, that's a great question, uh, uh, really. I mean, I, you, when you get to the president's office, they give you levers, and at the beginning, you think they're actually hooked to something, you know, but actually you realize you're just holding these, these sticks. <laughs> um, and, and, and I say that uh, because when I first joined the faculty, I, I joined the faculty. I'm at actually UCSF today, just uh, so, uh, uh, not in Oakland. And, and when I first joined the, the faculty, I, I joined the faculty of the same medical school I had graduated from and done my residency from. And I was a young, I was young, I was not 30 yet, joining the faculty. And so the professors on Monday, my colleagues on Monday had been my professors on Friday and I was now joining them. So I sat then at a faculty meeting with these same people I'd now known for years and that was great. Um, and I had a title, I was in charge of something, but that didn't change their feeling about me. And so if I said, well, here's what you're going to do to somebody who was twice my age and had taught me whatever, it didn't make any sense to them. And I, I, I felt then that the only way that I could affect the enterprise, I could engage in the enterprise and affect any kind of change was to actually have a good idea. That, that when I said this to them, they'd have to say, gee, that's a good idea. I see why I will want to do that and how that works. And that became my, my only lever uh, back then. And it's still, I feel, it feels the same now. Now you have this so-called authority, but the enterprise is, is, is not, you, you, can't do any, you can't do anything to it. It's not like a business. Um, uh, you really have to work with uh, we, shared governance is a real thing. Uh, the community of great ideas that we have is a real thing. The terrific students and faculty and staff that we have, and, and you know that, that your, your colleagues are amazing people, your students are amazing, the staff that support all of us, are, these are amazing people. 
and we really work together collectively to get the best ideas and then to do what we can to push them forward. And um, as that's really been the same since the very beginning. So sticking with the topic of, of levers that one can pull as a leader, um, several of the people uh, in our audience are not just from university settings, but also from industry. And yes. I wonder if you could comment a little bit about um, the levers available to you as the leader of a university system versus the leaders available to say a CEO of a firm. And in what ways do you think um, things are more challenging for university leaders and in what ways might they actually be easier in terms of um, the, the, the change management of all of this? Well, I, easier in change management in universities, I can't put together in a, in a sentence that's uh, co you know, coherent and say, I'd, I'd say that, you know, we deal the, the one of our parts of our DNA um, would, would be the tenure system for our faculty. And so we don't have the lever of, you know, you're, um, we don't think this is working out. Uh, that's a non, a non sequitur in our, uh, mm -hmm. It's how can we make this work? What do we what do we want to do to help be engaged? Is how we have to address things, and so it it requires, and you know this as university leaders, uh, your careers, you really work with your colleagues from day one on trying to forge relationships and ways you can support each other and getting to mutually agreed upon goals, and that becomes the way that you you, you deal with things. You you we we don't uh, we don't just um, uh, tell people that, gosh, we don't think it's working out or thank you for your service and, and they're gone. Um, so, so, that's a, so that just means that you have to really build consensus to build change. And you have to work really, really hard on that. Now, one thing that we have, you, you know, we, it, it's very difficult. We have a whole series of filters to being hired and to being brought on board. And so we're able to uh, really nurture people who, who, who seem to believe in the mission and the values that we have when they come to join us. And so we, we tend to have a community of supportive colleagues to work with us. And we have very thoughtful, very intellectually competent and, uh, and talented people. So that's a benefit for, uh, for us. Um, and, and I think those are the things that we, that, that's kind of the two sides of the coin. We have really talented, uh, knowledgeable, thoughtful people who have opinions and whose buy-in we need to usually uh, uh, achieve before we can make meaningful change. Knowing that we don't try to make much change without that buy-in, and maybe that saves us down the line. We don't find ourselves on the end of a, a limb uh, by ourselves with somebody sawing it. Every once in a while it happens, and uh, but in general we we try to grow things along together with consultation. I think that's very very helpful. Terrific. Jenny, shall we turn to the audience Q&A at this point? Yeah, I, I saw one that looks interesting. Um, just back on that point, of course, the downside of that consensus is that things take longer. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you, you know, I'll say with, with that, just to answer that, um, but I try not to let, we try not to let that stop us. We try to actually move things forward and not allow, keep, keep ourselves moving and try to have goals. And so some of the things that you would do more in business where you have dashboards and, and outcomes and things. We try to use more of that, I think, than may have been the case in universities of yesteryear. And, and we were able to see things change like the diversity at my last two campuses, or we wanted to move to double NIH funding at the last uh, campus in five years. We were able to double it in four and a half years. So you, you, you can do things if you set goals and metrics and put yourself to them. Um, you just have to work harder at building the consensus and have it be a consensus of change. Yeah, yeah, great, great insights. So um, one of our audience members, Ariel Blair, um, is in, interested in asking a little bit more about this idea of inclusion. And I'll just read her question. One of the issues that people sometimes have with discussions around inclusion is that they do not understand the ways in which the system is not inclusive. So what lessons have you learned about ways to help folks understand what a more inclusive environment actually means? How would you assess it? I think of that in two ways, I guess. Uh, first, I mentioned systemic racism. Let me give my analogy, see if this works a little bit. I don't want to in any way trivialize it. And it's in this, I would feel better in a room where I could see people to make sure I'm communicating. But I, 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 I think of a golfing analogy. I haven't played golf in years. Um, um, but a, a thing that happens in golf is that, that I learned is that 
you're standing on a green and the sun is in back of you and it's like in the evening, the blades of grass are bent a little bit towards you just because they're following the sun. So they're bent a little towards you. And the ball doesn't roll as fast when the blades of grass are bent just slightly toward it. You can't see it, but it just doesn't roll quite as fast. And if you're on golf courses and you're up on a hill and there's water down, let's say to your left, that water had to flow down there from somewhere and, and the ball, everything will tend to flow down toward the water. And so one of the things that I think of um, well, how our institutions are set up, if you're standing here and it looks like the hole is straight in front of you, but the grain is going against you and there's a break to the left, if you just put the ball straight, it's not gonna make it. You're gonna be short of the hole and just not ever get there. And someone else who's on a green and looks for all intents and purposes the same can just roll it straight and it goes in the hole. What's the problem there? You gotta put more into it to get it up and higher and you gotta get it just right or else you'll miss. And, and I think that, I don't know if it's in any way to be trivialized, but there are these invisible challenges in daily life that affect people uh, who are uh, in whatever circumstance, the, the other, the non-chosen, uh, uh, many of us find that there are these extra, this extra effort we have to put into things and we have to be more precise to get there and it's not fair or appropriate and, and it's um, time inclusive, time, time intensive. So, so to be an inclusive institution, I think you have to recognize that on both sides, when you see it, when you do it, when you feel it. And, and you have to work to try to make it that you incorporate that into the thinking and the way that you move forward, that someone can come in and, and, and be welcome and included in a, um, a system that may not be balanced. And you have to work to try to balance it and, 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 and make it fair. The second thing I will think of that's been a lot to me. And I, I would say this happened more, I got more of this as chancellor. So I, as a medical doctor, my patients came to me, they needed my services, they we tended to get along, that was great. When I became chancellor, I found that people were very willing to disagree with me, you know, but they, they had no hesitation to tell me what I didn't know. And I found that uh, somebody sat down in front of me, and if I looked at the person and tried to assess them, turned out that pretty quickly I learned that I was wrong as much as I was right. I, just, I, I, I didn't know. And uh, we had, there was a great deal of diversity on the campus. This was Irvine. And so I realized that before I knew what this person would be likely to think, I had to listen to what she said or listen to what they said. And, um, and, and, and it helped me to not judge or arrive with prejudged impressions or if I found myself with those to try to move them aside and really engage with the person to hear what they were saying uh, uh, before I then went forward with our relationship. And, and, uh, and that's been, that was a great lesson to, uh, to experience. And uh, I've had, you know, it's, I had a, a kind of a gratifying experience. Last thing I'll say on this, I may gratifying is where I teach a freshman seminar. So I taught that all these last years, didn't teach this year, but I taught, a year ago, and I'll teach next year. And in my freshman seminar, I had 18 students, so I get to know them a little bit. It's great fun. My favorite day of the week was the day that I was teaching. That was wonderful. And um, so I taught students. That's fine. And um, I had a, a, a student who came to see me as a senior, and I had them in my class as a freshman. And they came to see me as a senior. And one of the things the student said when as a senior was that the class back those years ago had helped create their career path. They wanted to go into the kind of work that we were studying uh, in, in the course. And this little one unit class had helped to find a career path. So it's very gratifying. I mean, you know how that is. It's, 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 uh, it's moving to have someone say that. But the thing that I noticed as, as, as he was saying this to me is that the, the group that I was meeting with was the transgender uh, group of students on campus. who so I met with regularly every year just as to, uh, as a check-in, but I had no idea that the student was transgender um, throughout the entire time. And so I learned that later. And it was just an interesting thing that had I made an assumption, which I'm happy I didn't, I would have made an, an incorrect assumption. And getting to know the person was great. Uh, and learning there were things that I might have assumed by the appearance would have been wrong. Uh, was just a reinforcement of the fact that you have to 
know somebody before you make assumptions. And um, that was just another example of that that I thought was very helpful. Long answer. <laughs> Sorry, big question. Very helpful. Thank you. I think we have time for probably one last audience question before we conclude. And I think we'll go to one from Rebecca Miller, who asks you to gaze into your crystal ball and uh, think about a post-COVID world and how the UC system as a whole and how the individual campuses might evolve uh, in that world and what new frontiers we should really be focusing on as a system. Well, easy, simple question. I, I have the answer exactly. So that's nice. the, answer it's, it's, <laughs> the answer is D. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, so let me say one thing that we've seen, that we've, this has been an, an onslaught, but we are, as people, resilient. That's uh, resilient and adaptable. Our system is resilient and adaptable. Uh, so that's uh, gratifying. That's not been the case for all higher education institutions. So we feel blessed that we have such resilient and, and adaptable students and faculty and staff. So that's uh, been something I've learned. In the, the future we're evolving toward, um, a couple of things. One is that I uh, want everyone to get vaccinated. I think that that's a, a, a critical step to stopping the pandemic so that we can get to the future. So I, I would advocate um, for that. And I know there's vaccine, there, now it's over 2 million a day this last week on average. So they're more than ever. It's still not enough yet, but I uh, wanna just make sure that people have followed the data to see the safety of the vaccine and the real efficacy. And I had more data today from a local study showing the vaccines to be extraordinarily efficacious. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, that's something. I think that we're going to be more like our colleagues and friends in Asia have been, were in fact a year ago, having gone through SARS and a few other things that they that they experienced more severely than we did, they were going to be much more attuned to zoonotic um, uh, viral pandemics that are coming forward. We've had several uh, 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 of these uh, uh, in epidemics and then pandemics in the last several years. So we had SARS and Ebola and um, H1N1. I mean, so it's not been, this is the first time this has happened. Um, uh, this one much, much worse than the others. But so I think we'll be reactive more quickly and we'll have cultural changes that we uh, adopt that are, uh, are, are different than the way we were before. We're not gonna come to work sick anymore or sneezing or, or whatever and, and tough it out. I think we'll be shunned if we do that and we'll stay home under those circumstances. We'll, I think, be rapid to use public health guidelines if, when, if, if and when we have the next um, um, uh, uh, disease uh, vector will, or disease come uh, to us, we'll really uh, be more rapid as communities to re react to it, to try to uh, sequester things. I think those things will be the case. I think that we'll be um, uh, more careful with hand hygiene and other things like that. Um, you know, you, you, we all have these busy jobs and, and I will say that my job uh, in as uh, my last two jobs uh, involved at uh, uh, public events about 300 nights a year, uh, traveling or hosting or visiting. Uh, that was my, my wife and I had that kind of schedule. And what we found is that we had to be religious about our hand hygiene or else we would just get sick. We'd be with hundreds of people in different cities and whatever and then we just get colds. So we, you know, you, you, I think that our community will crank up its own vigilance um, on, on those kinds of things. I'm hoping that we can be, we've said that we're gonna um, do everything we can to be largely in person in the fall. I think that will be, I hope that's between largely and very largely. So I think that that's, you know, things are moving in a good direction for us, um, but I think we'll be more thoughtful. I also think, let me be quick and say that I, we've learned that some things are uh, convenient and maybe better even on, telemedicine or on Zoom. So easier to get together with people in different countries for a two hour meeting than it used to be when you had to fly halfway around the world to do that. And I think we'll do that. I think telemedicine will mean that many more of us are able to have uh, easier visits with our, our practitioners without taking off half a day, driving, parking, waiting, being seen for a few minutes and then driving and going back to work. We can dial in for a time and just spend 15 minutes or half an hour with with the, the provider and that will be better. So I think we'll incorporate some things that we've learned. And I think that we all, I hope, I hope have a real uh, a heightened level of appreciation with how much we love each other and how much the ability to be with each other is the most important thing 
that um, that we have and that we'll treasure those moments um, uh, as we're able to uh, to get back to them uh, in these next several months. Wonderful. I especially appreciated your golfing metaphor um, because it highlights sort of the subtle structural issues that are very difficult to surface and identify, right? I, I never even thought I golf very occasionally and I never even thought about the direction of the sun and how it, how it affects the blades of grass. Um, and that's something that takes, you know, real explicit study and, and observation to, to kind of un, literally to unearth. Um, so really, really helpful. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Drake. We, we are so grateful for um, your time and your insights and we're incredibly excited about the future of the university um, on your watch. And we will all be cheering you um, from our respective campuses and uh, hope that you will call on us um, if there's anything that we can do to, to help. Um, we are all here because we love this university and we love what it stands for. Uh, so um, uh, thank you so much for your service and thank you for your insightful and uh, inspiring words. Well, thank you very much. I look forward actually to being on campus uh, as the circumstances allow. And please uh, uh, arrange to come by and say hello when, when, when I do. We will for sure. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you. Take thank care. So we were just going to wind up with um, uh, two quick notices. Uh, one is to please feel free to join us for additional Berkeley Culture Initiative activities. Uh, we have our annual conference coming up next January, uh, and that includes, as Samir said, an academic portion and a corporate portion. Um, we are beginning a graduate student research grant program, uh, if that's of interest to you. Uh, we are continuously facilitating academic industry research partnerships, which have been fascinating. We've been studying the evolution of COVID in the workplace. Um, and we are actively disseminating new research findings. We have a newsletter that comes out quarterly. We'd be happy for you to join us on our uh, mailing list. Uh, we also have a working paper series. Uh, and our mission really is to share best practices about cultivating an effective culture. Uh, and we study it and um, we learn about it from, from our academic colleagues as well as from various corporations. So finally, um, in thanking um, the team. Every event like this uh, actually requires a huge amount of heavy lifting um, from people who don't necessarily appear on the screen. And so we want to thank uh, pr uh, President Drake as well as his team at UCOP. Uh, we also want to thank our Dean Speaker Series staff um, who had actually two events today. Um, and we want to thank uh, Hope Harrington and our Berkeley Culture Initiative team. Thank you all so much for joining us. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.